behalf of our president, Dr. Hollinger, and as the dean of the faculty, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you one of our dear colleagues, Dr. Donna Petter, associate professor of Old Testament, director of the Hebrew language program. Dr. Petter, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, still proudly waves the terrible towel. <laughs> the first fingerprints that God laid on her heart undoubtedly came through her experience with youth with a mission. And in particular with the School of Biblical Studies founded by one of our own graduates, Ron Smith. It was in that experience that Dr. Petter learned what discipleship actually looks like. Having to read the Bible not once, not twice, but five times in a six-month period, studying each day uh, six hours. She learned that the Word shapes our hearts by the power of the Spirit. And from that moment, those years, I should say, really, it has been Donna's passion to see the word disciple others. She received her Bachelor's of Arts at the University of the Nations in Kona, Hawaii. Somebody has to suffer somewhere, I think, for Jesus. <laughs> she received her MA and her MAR here at Gordon-Conwell before receiving her MA and her PhD in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. Dr. Petter has taught the Bible for more than 20 years across four continents. It has been our rich privilege to have her on our faculty teaching Hebrew and Hebrew exegesis, theologies of the Old Testament, ancient Near Eastern religions, but mostly teaching about Jesus. Her best friend, I think apart from her husband Tom and her son Marcus, surely has to be Ezekiel. <laughs> her doctoral dissertation, Ezekiel in the City Laments, has been published. She has published study notes with Zondervan on the book of Ezekiel. She's now working on a commentary on the whole book of Ezekiel. And I suspect she might have something to say tonight about those bones back in Ezekiel. <laughs> she is married to Dr. Thomas Petter, another beloved colleague, professor, associate professor of Old Testament, and a beloved friend also, son Marcus. They live here in Hamilton. Would you give a warm welcome to our own Dr. Donna Petter? wait for this night. <laughs> what a privilege it is for me to be here before you. I was so honored when Dr. Hollinger invited me, and I knew instantly that I had to do it because my passion is to bring us into worship tonight as we hear the word of the Lord together. So graduating class of 2015, hear the word of the Lord. Can these bones live? That might be a question that you asked yourself sometime here at seminary. I am sure of it. <laughs> Can these bones live? With this question, God was probing the prophet Ezekiel's heart. But the real question behind that question was, Ezekiel, what is your perspective of the mess that God's people have made of their lives? And so I, too, put this question before you tonight. Can these bones live? What is your perspective about the messes God's people have made of their lives? 
As one exiled and living among the exiles in Babylon, the prophet Ezekiel felt deep ramifications of that exile. And the exile, as we all know, was a moment in Israelite history when that country ceased to exist and the people were moved, they were plucked up from their land, and it was the price they paid, a high price for sin's consequences. The exile and the accompanying sentiment of that death-like hopelessness, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off, happened for a good reason on account of compromising in their faith. And for doing what was right in their own eyes, Ezekiel's audience, they caved to culture. They failed God miserably, and as a result, they suffered the consequences through the exile. Ezekiel and his audience, they experienced deep emotional and spiritual impact as a result. And sadly, most of it was self-imposed. Can life come out of death? Although God doesn't directly ask Ezekiel this particular question, the startling images in the vision of chapter 37, a valley full of bones that have long been dead, and a graveyard, begs this question. Can life come out of death? Not to mention the fact that a graveyard scene mirrors their sentiments. So I want to focus on the graveyard imagery just for a moment. There is no better image than a graveyard with sealed shut graves to illustrate hopelessness. You'll agree. Metaphorically speaking, they felt and they perceived that they were left for dead. And as the graves were sealed shut, so too was their fate isolated from and dead to the promises of God. Can these bones live? Can life come out of death? Such were the conditions and the context for Ezekiel's ministry. And so it, too, will be for you. Whether your specific ministry context is a call to the global church or a call to the globe, your broader ministry landscape will be a confrontation with sin's consequences because sin's consequences know no bounds. Sin's consequences are not confined to an exile described in the Old Testament. And so as a result of this reality, God may probe your heart as he did with Ezekiel. Can these bones live? Can life come out of death? Essentially, the question behind the question for you as you go from this place is what is your perspective about the messes that God's people have made of their lives? Ministry can be messy. Deep emotional and spiritual impact is caused because of sin's circumstances. You might have to go to the hospital to visit a church member who left her husband for another man. And as you counsel with their children, what might you say? What will be your perspective about the upheaval in this woman's life and the life of their children and her former husband? Is there any hope? Not only is ministry messy at times because folks compromise in the faith, but sometimes, too, the minister messes up. We read about it all too often, I'm afraid. When ministry struggles settle in, rather than go to God and then rather than trust in Him, the minister resorts to other ways to generate funds, namely embezzlement. According to estimates from the Center for the Study of Christianity, Christian ministries are responsible for about $50 billion worth of embezzlement. The minister who has been doing what is right in his or her own eyes gets caught and the consequence is jail. Deep emotional and spiritual impact is caused because of sin's consequences. What will be your perspective about the self-imposed turmoil in this minister's life? As you're leaving Gordon-Conwell, you need to know that at times 
you're going to be mopping up messes in the ministry. Don't kid yourself, because although there are about 300 degrees that are being awarded this year with various specializations empowering you for key ministerial tasks, you really will become a specialist in mopping up messes in the ministry. I can tell you countless times I got out the mop and I started mopping and I started ministering. Not with my great exegetical insights from Ezekiel and not from my great exegetical insights from the Old Testament, but with his mercy and with his love. And so as you leave this place, it's imperative that you know your audience and you know your ministry context. People will be in your midst who are experiencing exile-like consequences because of compromising in the faith. You will be up close, and you will see the self-imposed scars on people because of doing what is right in their own eyes. And as you see the graveyards of people's lives, and as you hear something like this, I can't do this anymore. My hope is gone. God will never want me back in church. God will likely be probing your own heart can these bones really live? Can life come out of death? Is there any hope? So what's the answer? Sovereign Lord, you alone know is what Ezekiel said in response when God asked him, can these bones live? Ezekiel didn't dare to presume to know the answer. He didn't appeal to his priestly knowledge of Torah and quote it back to God, although he could have. Instead, he appealed to the God he knew, a God who had full authority and utter control over the bleak and the self-imposed consequences for sin. You see, it wasn't what Ezekiel knew, but it was who he knew. And so he turns the question back to God to get the divine perspective. Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And he allowed God to speak. And here is what God said. Listen, I am going to open your graves. I am going to bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Not only does God promise to initiate restoration, but he makes it clear that restoration is supernatural. In case you're not certain, Opening graves and pulling people out is just not natural. And this act of restoration is described no less than a resurrection. And so indeed, God was promising a chronological end to sin's consequences. But there's more. When this supernatural act of restoration happens, God also promised this. My people, you will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you up th from them. This unsolicited supernatural act of restoration produces something powerful, a revelation of his character. You will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves. In other words, they would experience him, his compassion and mercy once again as their Lord. And even while living in sin's consequences, notice that he retains his relational affections and addresses them as my people. But there's more. Restoration is the divine presence. It says in verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. And this statement not only sums up our vision in 37, but it shows how restoration is even possible. Dead people live and are restored because of God's presence. Only the power of the divine presence will cause spiritually dead men and women to wake up to the sound of his voice. Thus, in our verses, God provides Ezekiel with the answer to the question, can these bones live? The answer, it's not what you know, but who you know. Ezekiel knew a God who was sovereign over these hopeless circumstances of the exile. 
in his time, this God would initiate something supernatural in order to reveal himself and reaffirm his commitment to them. Indeed, Ezekiel knew a God who makes the impossible possible. The answer reveals God's perspective on the mess people have made of their lives. And so the answer is not just for Ezekiel, but the answer is for us as well. It reveals God's perspective on the mess that people have made of their lives. And God wanted Ezekiel and he wants us to see the answer to their dreadful circumstance was having a God lens. With a God lens, the answer is quite clear. Believing in restoration is akin to believing in resurrection brought about by a sovereign God. The answer shows that there was indeed an end in sight for sin's consequences. And thus God's response to people who are impacted emotionally and spiritually by sin's consequences is yes, yes. We should jump from our seats and say, yes, yes, these bones can live. Life can come out of death. death. Therefore, restoration is possible. Expect it. Hope for it. Wait for it. Because it all depends on God. But God's answer to Ezekiel anticipates the ultimate answer to the question, can these bones live? The whole point of the vision is to see, to see the impossible becoming possible because God shows up. And as a result, his life-giving presence brings restoration. And indeed, God showed up to restore and bring life out of death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. God initiated a supernatural restoration through Jesus. God sent Jesus into our exile-like circumstances. Jesus was a tangible manifestation of God's grace and mercy to people living in sin's consequences. Jesus is the restorative answer to the messes people make of their lives. And so Jesus is your God-given lens through whom we must cling to and hope for with restoration. And so, because of Jesus, you have the answer. It's not what you know, but it's who you know. By dying on the cross, Jesus displayed God's great compassion. The message was loud and the message was clear. I am going to get you out of your mess even if my life depends on it. And indeed, his life depended on it. As the old hymn says, our sin not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and we bear it no more. But there is more, because up from the grave, he rose again. Through the supernatural act of the resurrection, Dead men and women wake up to the sound of his voice and live. The resurrection enables the supernatural transformation from death to life. Look around at your fellow graduates because each one of you, you are living proof of that transformation, that death is no more and that out of death comes life. It's what Paul says in Ephesians, that you have been raised with Christ. And so because of your belief in the resurrection that was brought about by the sovereign God, you can see the possibility of restoration in people's lives. And you dare not write off even the most troubling scenarios that you face where you go in ministry. 
Your staunch belief in the resurrection matters as you minister and as you see the graveyards of people's lives. It's not what you know, but it's who you know, and you know the risen Lord. Not only do you have the answer and possess the God lens from which to understand the messes people have made of their lives, but I want to remind you of something else. All 316 of you graduating tonight or tomorrow are tangible manifestations of God's ministry, of God's mercy to the global church. He chases people through you and he pursues people through you. Surely his goodness and his mercy will pursue me all the days of my life, says the psalmist. And as you proclaim his word, hopeless people experience him through you. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, God's people have ongoing daily restoration. Accordingly, God continues then to perform supernatural acts of restoration in our midst. But I want to ask, why? Why would God bother? Why would God bother to initiate restoration with people who have personally and willfully affronted him? Got to ask that question. God initiates restoration because restoration is missional. The work of restoration not only begins with God, but it also ends with him. He opens the graves, and in the end, those that have been raised and restored acknowledge him as God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. And so for this reason, restoration is missional. Restoration causes us to share with people what God has done in our lives. And so when we share our stories of restoration, we're doing what the psalmist did. We are declaring that God's unwavering, staunch, long-term loyalty is the only logical explanation for his restorative acts in our lives. We're testifying to the greatness of his, you know that great Hebrew word that I love, chesed, which has like 10 English words comparable to it, five Greek ones possibly. We're testifying to the greatness of his chesed, the greatness of his steadfast love. And so restoration is missional because it lauds God's character, but particularly his faithfulness and his holiness. Psalm 51 provides a great example of the missional nature of restoration in an individual's life. In Psalm 51, David shares his story, as it were, of restoration. David was Israel's greatest king. He was a military genius. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And he was one who deeply loved the word. However, David compromised, and he compromised grossly with God's holy standards. He committed adultery. He got a woman pregnant. He tried to cover it up. And when the first cover-up didn't work, he resorted to the ultimate cover-ups. He had the husband of his lover killed on the battlefield. Enter stage right, Nathan the prophet. God initiated restoration with David by sending Nathan to confront David and uncover the cover-up. Nathan was a tangible manifestation of God's mercy to David. Only after being confronted by Nathan does David acknowledge wrongdoing. And although smitten at one time by a woman's beauty, he was now smitten by his sin before a holy God. I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And in the psalm, this leads him then to say, forgive me on the basis of your covenantal loyalty. Forgive me on the basis of your chesed. 
It leads him to say, cleanse me from my sin on the basis of your compassion. And then in the psalm, he anticipates restoration. And he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And this was so because he knows that God accepts. He knew God would accept and would not despise his broken and crushed spirit over sin's consequences. And listen to the results of restoration in David's life. Restore me, and then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. The results of God's deliverance in David's life. And then my tongue will not sing quietly about your righteousness, but my tongue will sing aloud, he says, of your righteousness, and my mouth will declare your praise. So David's restoration is missional because God initiated it. God got the ball rolling by sending Nathan, and in the end, David lauds God's holiness and his faithfulness. So this is why God bothers. This is why God bothers to bring restoration to people who continually turn their backs on him, whether in salvation or in the ongoing process of restoration. It is all for the praise of his glorious grace. And so we are trophies of his grace, trophy after trophy, lining the heavenly shelves of grace. Clearly then, there is no room for spiritual plagiarism in the kingdom of God. Credit for fruitfulness in the ministry goes to him because God doesn't like partial credit. He doesn't get partial credit. Indeed, God, says Isaiah, does not share his glory with any other. He gets all the glory, even though he does it through you and through me. And so this fact that God alone restores should take the pressure off of you as you go out and minister. We can't restore people, but we know the one who restores. And although we celebrate tonight and acknowledge that you've worked hard, I mean, look at you. You've worked hard, and we are proud of the tireless work that you've put into your classes to learn how to preach, to do missions, to understand church history, to grasp Greek and Hebrew, to do counseling and theology. And we're proud of that hard work, valuable time, money, and energy. But it is still not what you know, but it's who you know. You know the sovereign Lord God. You know Jesus, the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know the one who's coming again to restore all things. And so, I ask you graduating class of 2015, can these bones live? Can life come out of death? If it depends solely on you and what you know, most certainly not. Your ministry might motivate people to get out of bed for a Sunday morning service but only the power and the presence of the sovereign Lord God will get people out of the metaphorical and little, literal grave for a service in eternity. Amen. Amen. Amen.